Our next lecture is by Dr. Craig Thomas. Dr. Thomas received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Indianapolis in 1995 and his PhD from Syracuse University in 2000. He then undertook postdoctoral work at Arizona State University. In 2003, Dr. Thomas moved to the NIH as the Director of Chemical Biology Corps at NIDDK. Currently, Dr. Thomas serves as the Chemistry Technology Section Group Leader at NCATS. I'm confident you will enjoy today's lecture. Good morning, uh, afternoon, or evening as the case may be. Uh, my name is Craig Thomas. I'm going to be providing you with some background uh, and current information on how we've arrived at uh, our ability to provide drug combinations uh, for the treatment of various diseases. Why are drug combinations desirable? Uh, many reasons. Uh, primarily, uh, the combination of drugs can yield increased efficacy uh, in the disease state for which they're trying to uh, treat. Uh, decreased uh, dosing, which oftentimes will uh, be desirable for uh, the elimination or reduction of side effects, and the ability to overcome resistance. Um, currently, drug combinations represent the standards of care for multiple indications, uh, as for instance, the uh, treatment of cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas in particular, uh, our CHOP is the standard of care. Um, this is a combination of five drugs, uh, rituximab, uh, monoclonal antibody targeting uh, CD20, cyclophosphamide, uh, which is a DNA cross-linking small molecule, doxorubicin, uh, which is a topoisomerase 2 inhibitor, vincristin, uh, which is tubulin polymerization inhibitor, and prednisone, which is a corticosteroid. For the treatment of HIV, uh, we rely upon uh, multiple different drug combinations that are collectively referred to as the highly active antiretroviral therapies or heart therapies. Um, one example is atripla, uh, which is a combination of the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor um, in tricytabine, um, another nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, uh, tenofovir, and efavirazine, a uh, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. The treatment of uh, malaria uh, relies upon what are referred to as artemisinin and combination therapies, or ACTS. Um, one of the primary ACTS is coartine, which is a combination of uh, artemether uh, and lumefantrin. Both are widely referred to as antimalarials, as their mechanisms are not fully understood. How have drug combinations been discovered in the past? Um, this is a, a, a really interesting topic, and before we can really understand where we are today, it's important to consider uh, how we've gotten there. Um, I would recommend uh, reading this cancer research article, which was published in 2008, as a good window into the history of how chemotherapy has evolved uh, for the treatment of cancer. Um, further, I would recommend the reading of uh, the Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, The Emperor of All Maladies, by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Uh, which came out several years ago, uh, which also gives a, a terrific uh, retelling uh, of uh, how cancer is treated uh, over the years. Um, the development of drug combinations uh, for the treatment of cancer is, is, is very storied. Um, I'll start with the uh, first well-received uh, combination of drugs for the treatment of pediatric leukemias, which evolved in the 1960s. I uh, referred to as VAMP, it's actually developed here at the NIH uh, by uh, uh, incredibly bold and intrepid researchers and clinicians. Uh, the the VAMP combination uh, refers to vincristine, uh, again the tubulin polymerization inhibitor, uh, aminopterin, uh, which is also known as uh, methotrexate, which is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, 6-mercaptopurine, uh, uh, nucleotide metabolism inhibitor, uh, modulator, um, and prednisone. Um, not only is the discovery of this combination for the treatment of leukemia uh, a rather interesting story, but each of these drugs uh, has their own really remarkable uh, history to them. Vincristin uh, is a, a drug that was um, discovered and um, championed by Eli Lilly, uh, first in hope that it might be an anti-diabetic uh, drug. Uh, methotrexate, uh, uh, long and storied history to that drug, uh, developed by uh, a team led by uh, Sidney Farber. 
um, the uh, mercaptopurine classes of drugs um, developed by several scientists uh, at the University of Wisconsin in particular. Uh, they went on to win the Nobel Prize for this work. Um, each of these molecules has a very storied and interesting history. And then, of course, their combination uh, as treatments for pediatric leukemia uh, became some of the first uh, successful treatments uh, for that disease. Um, the same researchers that championed the VAMPT protocol uh, moved forward with additional protocols, including the MOMPT and MOPT uh, protocols for pediatric acute leukemia and Hodgkin's lymphomas, which were developed and reported in the 1970s. Many of the same drugs were incorporated, um, but addition, additions including uh, mustergen, which are DNA alkylating agents, uh, were incorporated into these, these treatments. And again, uh, these DNA alkylating agents uh, derove with a remarkably interesting uh, history, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, the use of mustard gases uh, in World War I uh, led to the stockpiling of those uh, weapons in World War II. Uh, exposure to some of these uh, mustard gases uh, in ships in the, in the port of Bari, Italy uh, during World War II uh, led physicians to study the sailors who were exposed. They noticed a uh, reduction in bone marrow uh, uh, cells and in uh, lymph nodes, which led to the theory that uh, possibly these would be good therapies for the treatment of leukemias and lymphomas. Um, and that did turn out to be the case, and, and DNA uh, cross-linking and alkylating agents remain a uh, standard of care even today, and part of many drug combinations. Um, this is a quote directly from the Cancer Research article. Uh, Based upon these efforts to develop new combinations of drugs, uh, in the United States by 1984, the national mortality uh, from childhood leukemia and Hodgkin's disease had both fallen by 65% as these new therapies were adopted uh, broadly. Um, so how are modern drug combinations being discovered? Uh, the aforementioned combinations, uh, the MOMP and the MOP, uh, these were clinical trial and error. Uh, these were physicians uh, adding drugs uh, in patients in the hopes of better outcomes. Um, today, the iterative uh, exploration uh, uh, of drugs is different. Um, we could pursue the iter iterative exploration of drug combinations in humans in the 1960s, 1960s and 70s because there weren't that many drugs. Uh, and of course, that's changed. Um, the good news of, of that change is that we have many more therapies for the treatment of human disease, specifically cancer. Um, tamoxifen for breast cancer in the 1980s, all transretinoic acid for the acute promyelocytic leukemia. Um, in the 1990s, Herceptin uh, for HER2 positive breast cancer. In the 2000s, uh, Matinib for CML, uh, uh, Gefetinib, Erlotinib for EGFR mutant uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Bertuzumib uh, emerged uh, during that time period for the treatment of multiple myeloma. Serafinib for renal cancers. Um, Sunitinib for uh, uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Um, and just to name a few. And of course, in the current decade, uh, over 100 new drug approvals for oncology indications uh, have been made. Um, in addition to these more recent approvals, uh, the older drugs, but still useful chemotherapies, um, over 1,000 new drugs are currently undergoing clinical investigation in humans for the treatment of cancers. Now, this is great news. This uh, means that there are more opportunities, more options for patients. Uh, and of course, uh, many of these are targeted therapies uh, for specific cancers with uh, a genomic uh, uh, cause. Um, but it does create a difficulty as we try and combine these new therapies with one another for the most effective treatment of those cancers. Um, let's consider the testing of only 250 drugs for possible combination studies. Um, the way we do this math is 250 uh, times 249 divided by 2. Uh, that results in 3,000 or 31,125 two-way combinations. If we were to consider the iterative uh, evaluation of three-way combination, that number explodes uh, uh, up to over 2.5 million uh, different uh, possible combinations of those drugs. Um, obviously, that's an untenable uh, um, 
consideration for the treatment of these therapies in humans. So modern drug combinations can be discovered in two different ways. Uh, one, uh, rational uh, combinations of agents based upon uh, a mechanistic uh, guide. Um, let's consider for the uh, moment uh, the story of the BRAF uh, inhibitors and melanoma. Um, as melanoma uh, was better understood from a molecular basis, it became clear uh, that mutations within uh, the gene and uh, resulting protein BRAF were one of the causal elements of uh, that particular disease. As a result, uh, many organizations uh, designed and developed BRAF inhibitors. When those molecules were applied uh, in patients with advanced uh, melanoma, uh, staggeringly good responses were discovered. Um, however, uh, these responses were short-lived, uh, with aggressive disease relapsing often within six months, um, sometimes sooner. Uh, a remarkable thing happened. Uh, scientists quickly uh, pounced on that discovery uh, and um, revealed the mechanistic cause for those relapsed and aggressive cells within uh, patients who were treated with BRAF inhibitors. Um, this led to the discovery that alternate uh, activation of the sig BRAF signaling pathway, which uh, includes the uh, MEK kinases, uh, were leading to these uh, relapsed events. So the rational combination of BRAF inhibitors with MEK inhibitors uh, uh, became one of the um, obvious things to try clinically uh, it, with remarkably good uh, results. Uh, some of the Kaplan-Meier results are shown here. Uh, uh, much better clinical outcomes when that, those drugs were applied uh, in combination. Um, of course, not all uh, diseases, cancer uh, in particular, have good, uh, obvious mechanistic reasons for combining specific drugs with specific mechanisms. Um, happily though, advances in robotics, uh, compound management, informatics, have enabled the high throughput evaluation in in vitro models of disease uh, to survey tens of thousands of drug combinations for synergy, additivity, or antagonism in only a matter of days. Um, good references for how those methods evolved are shown here at the bottom of this slide. So before we get into some of the methods that uh, are used to uh, do those uh, types of studies, let's, uh, let's cover a couple upfront questions. Uh, foremost, what is uh, synergy? What is additivity? What is antagonism? Uh, these are actually are not the most straightforward uh, questions to answer. Um, we can consider this from a number of different experimental inputs, uh, for instance, from a single dose of each drug. Uh, let's consider uh, a scenario where drug A at a single dose uh, is combined with drug B at a single dose, where both of those drugs alone uh, create a uh, percent response in a specific assay of around 15%, and the combination creates a specific response of around 30%. Uh, an alternate scenario, uh, drug A at a specific concentration plus drug B at a specific concentration actually uh, creates uh, a weaker response. Um, an alternate situation where drug A uh, plus drug B at those doses creates a uh, response which is significantly uh, enhanced. It's tempting to call these uh, uh, individually uh, additivity, antagonism, or synergy. Um, and it's, there's, there's nothing wrong with really doing that, although uh, the science has emerged in ways that allow us to, uh, with less uh, ambiguity, uh, make, those, make those labels. Um, we can also examine uh, molecules, uh, drugs, in dose response. Um, so in blue we see a, a curve, a dose response curve for drug A. Uh, in yellow, a dose response uh, curve for drug B. Um, the dotted red line would could be uh, the, the uh, theoretical additive curve if those molecules were combined. Um, whereas the combination sometimes could create a uh, stronger increase in the potency curve, or the dose response curve, um, or a stronger uh, percent response, which we refer to as efficacy in many situations. Um, an alternate way, and probably the most uh, uh, useful way to uh, consider drug combinations, uh, whether they're synergistic, additive, or antagonistic, 
are from dose response matrices. Uh, these are oftentimes referred to as checkerboard plots. Um, we call them matrix plots in our lab. Um, and what you're seeing here is an increase uh, concentration of drug X along the X axis, an increase in concentration along drug Y uh, along the Y axis. And as these drugs uh, are, are combined, you get a, a more rich uh, survey of the responses as they uh, uh, combine. So this kind of work has been done for a long time. Our early antibacterial research really uh, spearheaded this technology. Um, enterprising scientists, uh, many that came out of the Schreiber lab at Harvard University actually started a company which uh, 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 spearheaded many of the, the high throughput methods for creating these types of plots. Um, um, this company did a lot of uh, insightful and, and innovative things and, and one of the things that uh, we should all be happy they did, they published their methods. Labs like mine have, have copied those methods significantly. Um, and much of that work is detailed in this Nature Biotechnology paper from 2009. So multiple methods do exist for the actual uh, labeling uh, of specific outcomes as synergistic, additive, or antagonistic. Um, many of these are very old models uh, derived from uh, um, uh, models that were put in place to consider uh, the actions of multiple agents on uh, enzyme processes. Uh, the Bliss model from the 1930s um, is an independence model. It assumes that the drugs affects a process or a system by the independent action uh, and unrelated actions of the two drugs involved. Uh, the Low model uh, from the 1950s is an additivity model. It assumes the drug uh, the drugs in, 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 in question are affecting a process or system by similar or identical actions. Um, the GATAM model, sometimes referred as the uh, highest single agent uh, model, is a non-interaction model and assumes that a drug's effect on a process or system can mask the individual actions of the second drug. Um, I do want to point out on this slide, and you'll see these references uh, that are listed at the bottom of the slide uh, below, that, that this, these, these are reviewed well uh, in the published literature. Many of the, the, the publications I list are, are tremendous resources for more information uh, about these models. Um, Chow, the chow talalay uh, combination index theorem, uh, worked on by this team of scientists in the 1970s and 80s, as a unified theory of drug combinations, um, which integrates dose effect curves, uh, regardless of whether it's first or higher order dynamics, and regardless of the mechanism of action of the drugs. Um, the actual calculation, uh, that calculations that are used to label a drug combination as synergistic, uh, additive, or antagonistic um, uh, are best reviewed uh, by reviewing the, the publications that I've, I've shown at the bottom of the slide. I won't go through the math uh, for several reasons. Um, one, I don't purport to be an expert. Um, and two, uh, it deserves more time than we have uh, to give to the subject today. Uh, the Bliss model can be solved in this way, um, uh, solving for a beta uh, variable, um, where uh, when the beta variable is greater than one, uh, the drug combination is considered at those doses to be antagonistic. Uh, when it's equal to one, additive, and when it's less than one, uh, synergistic. In a similar way, uh, this equation can be solved for a gamma uh, metric, which again, greater than one equals antagonism, less than one synergy. Um, the chow talalay approach actually solves for a combination index value. Um, uh, very similarly, uh, when the CI value is less than one, uh, the drugs at that concentration are considered synergistic. When it's greater than one, the drugs at that concentration are considered antagonistic. Um, the chow kalalay approach can also uh, yield several outputs, visual outputs of the data. Um, because this is being done in dose response, you can see a broader swath of whether or not these drugs are combining in a synergistic or antagonistic fashion at multiple uh, dose overlaps. Um, fraction affected plots can be generated when the combination is done in a constant ratio. Uh, normalized isobolograms can be used for non-constant combination ratios. 
um, additional ways to label a drug combination as either synergistic, additive, or antagonistic uh, can be surface response modeling, as shown here. And uh, a good example is in this paper in uh, uh, 2007. Um, additional approaches when the system gets more complex, when multiple drugs can be uh, put into a uh, combination. Uh, these get more uh, complicated. Uh, researchers at uh, the aforementioned company started by a, a, a number of students uh, emerging from the Schreiber lab and later at Novartis uh, published this uh, paper in 2008 which gives you some, which if you review gives you some uh, insight into how complex uh, this situation can get. Um, a couple notes on uh, how to go about describing uh, drug combinations. Um, it's important and, and, and advisable to be careful with the labels that are used. Um, synergy can often be uh, thought of as enhancement or potentiation. Uh, we oftentimes adopt a label of beyond additivity um, as, as synergy, uh, the labeling of synergy can actually be quite complex in certain situations. Uh, furthermore, um, all of the computational methods which I just quickly reviewed, uh, it's advisable to be cautious with using any of them. Um, I quote George Box when saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, cell signaling networks, um, drug mechanism, pharmacology in general, um, the cellular response to the actions of two or more drugs are very complex. Um, as a result, uh, uh, each of the aforementioned models, and, and the scientists, the br really brilliant scientists who put together these different models, uh, took that into account. Um, but each of the models thus uh, incorporate specific biases and weigh data differently. Um, so it's important to uh, consider uh, uh, the methods by which uh, a label is ascribed to a specific drug combination, be it synergy or antagonistic, um, uh, with a degree of caution. Um, building upon the thoughts of others and standing on the shoulders of giants, I will state that, uh, uh, like others, it's important not to let this complexity keep you from performing an experiment or conducting an analysis. Um, but it's also important not to take the outcomes uh, of, of those experiments or analyses as uh, the gospel. Okay, so uh, this is data generated uh, in, in our lab at NCATS. Um, and, and I use it to, to describe how we go about uh, ascribing uh, labels such as synergy. So this is a, uh, a drug combination of a drug called niraparib and deporinad, and I'll describe how we arrived at this particular uh, uh, drug combination later in the lecture. On the left you see uh, a heat map, uh, a matrix uh, heat map or a uh, checkerboard plot um, that describes uh, uh, the percent response uh, of, of these drugs in this particular assay. Um, on the right, you see the delta bliss values uh, for each of the discrete outcomes, uh, which represent um, the combination of those drugs at specific concentrations. Um, so where you see a strong delta bliss value, uh, those are the concentrations where synergy exists when these drugs are combined. That's how we describe uh, uh, the combination outcomes from our lab, uh, that they are synergistic or antagonistic at specific concentrations. We typically do not say that a drug combination is synergistic overall. Uh, they are synergistic at specific concentrations. Um, the reason I think this is very important, and, and we've recognized it as have others, that uh, drug, drugs in combination, uh, the effects can change at different concentrations. Uh, here's another example from a, a different study where drug A, and I'm going to leave these vague, uh, drug A is combining with drug B at some of the concentrations where they are combining, uh, those two drugs are com combining in a synergistic fashion as detailed by the delta bliss outcomes uh, on the right. Uh, at other concentration overlaps, they are actually antagonistic as detailed by the delta bliss values uh, uh, that I've highlighted. So let's move on to the experimental methods. Um, uh, this is an oversimplification, but to produce the type of data that are going, will allow uh, you to understand whether two drugs are combining in a synergistic, additive, or antagonistic fashion, you need four basic needs. Um, 
One, you need a library of agents to screen. Drugs, uh, compounds, uh, natural product extracts. Um, you need a compound plating method. You have to be able to put the drugs in the wells where the tests are taking place um, at the right concentration. Uh, 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 different methods for this, uh, pipettes, pen tools, uh, acoustic dispensing technology. Uh, the third uh, essential need is an assay. Um, oftentimes cell toxicity assays or bacterial toxicity assays are conducted to generate the data that is then analyzed. And number four, a data processing method, uh, a method that will actually bring the data out of uh, those assays and allow you to perform one of the aforementioned uh, modeling uh, of that data. So these are an example library. This is the library that we use. We refer to this library as the MIPE library or the mechanism interrogation plate. Uh, all of the drugs within this library uh, have a known mechanism. Um, this particular library that we use in our lab is a collection of around 2,500 small molecules, um, around 900 approved drugs, 600 molecules in phase one, two, or three investigations, and 1,000 molecules that we refer to as preclinical molecules or probe molecules. Uh, this collection of, of drugs represents both diverse and redundant mechanism of action. Um, the plating method that we take advantage of uh, utilizes acoustic dispensing. Um, acoustic droplet, droplet ejection technology um, has emerged over the last decade as a very useful way to put drugs into wells. Um, this utilizes a pulse of ultrasonic uh, uh, energy to move low volumes of fluids, typically uh, nanoliters or picoliters, and this can be done using DMSO as a carrier solvent for your drug, but also water. Um, and it does so without any physical contact. This is very useful to us as physical contact sometimes will alter the concentration of both of the drugs you're trying to add to the same well. Um, and uh, uh, we, we utilize this acoustic technology to put uh, the drugs in the wells as I've described earlier. Uh, drug A along the um, x-axis in increasing concentration, drug B in the y-axis in increasing concentration. So the bottom row is drug A alone. The far right column is drug B alone. And then as they mix together, uh, we see uh, the effects of these drugs when combined. Um, an example of the assay format. Uh, many of the studies that we do are interrogations of cancer cell models of disease. Um, so cellular cytotoxicity is a very useful assay to conduct for those studies. Um, multiple uh, cell-based assays uh, uh, formats exist for the interrogation of a cytotoxicity of a drug or drug combinations in cells within assay plates. The cell titer glow uh, uh, assay is the one that we utilize uh, um, uh, more than any other. Um, and this is a, an assay that takes advantage of um, the conversion of luciferin to oxyluciferin, which actually produces light as well. Uh, utilizing uh, luciferase, uh, the enzyme luciferase. Um, this is reliant upon ATP. That enzymatic step won't occur without uh, the contribution of ATP. Living cells produce that ATP at the end of the assay. Uh, if all of the cells in that particular well are gone, uh, the ATP is quickly degraded and that enzymatic event can't occur and you wind up with a loss of signal, um, which represents cell death. Um, a data processing method, um, uh, really incredible scientist at NCATS, uh, led by Raj Guha, uh, created a web-based uh, uh, method for the output of this data. Um, this is a screenshot of that uh, web-based interface with the data. Um, on the far right, you actually can see the dose-response matrix, uh, a, a physical representation of those drugs in combination, and the delta bliss uh, plots of that same data. Um, other columns that we utilize within this pro data processing interface uh, show the cell line that was being screened. Uh, in this case, TC32 is a UN sarcoma uh, cell line. Uh, the drugs, A and B. And then a number of different columns that represent different uh, methods for uh, interpreting whether or not that combination as an aggregate is synergistic or antagonistic or additive. So. 
uh, to go through a project example. Um, I've already provided some of the data from uh, the work we've done within UN Sarcoma, which is a collaborative work that we've done with Lee Hellman, who's uh, now at the uh, University of Southern California, um, and experts here at NCI, including uh, Christine Heskey, uh, who's a, a clinician who studies UN Sarcoma. Um, UN Sarcoma is a bone soft tissue cancer prevalent in teenagers and young adults. 85% of the cases involve a translocation between chromosome 11 and 22, resulting in an aberrant protein that's oftentimes referred to as the EWS fly protein. Um, treatments, the standards of care for this drug, include surgery and radiation, um, and sometimes chemotherapy. chemotherapy. Um, aggressive uh, chemotherapy has resulted in cr increased survival rates, um, but most of those therapies are rather toxic to the individual and result in late stage effects for those patients who receive that therapy. So UN sarcoma uh, remains a very much an unmet medical uh, need. The way we oftentimes integrate these kind of projects into our lab at NCATS is we bring in the cell models of that disease. Uh, in this case, we worked with four different cell models uh, that represent uh, UN sarcoma. We screen these uh, uh, these cells versus uh, our MIPE collection, which at the time was around 2,000 approved and investigational drugs. From this work, which uh, I show a, a, a plot on the right, which kind of represents what this data looks like, um, from this work we found around 700, 679 agents which possessed activity in all four of the cell models of that particular of Ewing sarcoma. Um, mechanistic insight. Uh, the redundancy of the actions of those drugs, uh, the clinical status of each of those drugs. We, we're interested in uh, the approved or, or late stage uh, uh, drugs. Um, known toxicity limitations. Uh, we're all utilized to um, cull that 679 uh, agents down to a reasonable number of drugs for um, combination efforts. Now, obviously, we're not the only people doing these kind of studies. Um, this work published um, out of the Bennis Lab uh, at Harvard um, was published in the journal Nature in 2012, um, which really was a broad survey of drug sensitivities across many different cancer cell lines. A number of different lessons from this study, but one of the more important ones was the realization that Ewing sarcoma cell lines, um, cell models of Ewing sarcoma, responded very strongly to the class of drugs referred to as PARP inhibitors. Um, this is uh, figure four from that paper, which really illustrates the finding. Um, in our own work, we noticed a similar outcome. Uh, this is the activity of the PARP inhibitor niraparib uh, versus uh, all four of the Ewing's, sar Ewing's sarcoma lines that we studied uh, as part of our effort. Um, so PARP inhibitors were one of the, the drug classes we were uh, interested in and incorporated into the, the combination studies we performed. So we screened several cell lines in the end uh, in multiple 6x6 or 10x10 matrix screens. Uh, what that means is a combination of, uh, a 6x6 combination is actually a combination of five different concentrations of each drug, uh, including a DMSO uh, control. A 10x10 matrix is a uh, screening of nine concentrations of each of the drugs and a DMSO control. In the 6x6 uh, uh, survey, we usually use a, a rather uh, wide uh, uh, dispersion of doses. Within the 10 by 10 setting, we uh, make the dilution factors between doses much tighter uh, in hopes that uh, we see a, 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 a broader survey, a more, a more detailed survey of how those drugs combine. Um, all told in this uh, series of experiments, we screened over 200 agents, uh, which were examined in over 8,000 total drug combinations. Uh, the plot here uh, just shows one of those experiments where uh, 946 drugs were uh, screened, or 946 discrete combinations were assessed. And you can see the, the, the rankings of the most synergistic drugs uh, based upon the highest single agent uh, metric, um, including a, a combination of the drug Naviticlax, uh, and the drug AZD8055, which was the fourth ranked uh, drug surveyed in that particular experiment, uh, the fourth highest uh, excess HSA value. Um, the highest ranked combination of a PARP inhibitor, uh, niraparib, uh, was number 116, which was a combination of niraparib with deporinib. 
Um, the drugs which demonstrated strong synergy in those pilot studies were then advanced into the aforementioned 10 by 10 uh, combination uh, uh, studies. Uh, one of the outcomes we were particularly interested in is shown here, and I've already shown you this, this particular heat map, the combination of niraparib and deporinad, uh, both the percent response com, uh, on the left and the, and the delta bliss plot on the right. Um, the mechanisms, uh, the PARP inhibitor and uh, the PARP inhibitor niraparib and deporinad, which is an inhibitor of an enzyme called NAMPT, uh, was of particular interest to us. Now, one of the things that we often try to do is assure ourselves that drugs which are displaying synergy, like this uh, combination of niraparib and deporinad, uh, are based upon their mechanism of action. Um, one of the quickest ways to define that is to show that all PARP inhibitors, um, uh, when combined with all NAMPT inhibitors, um, universally uh, display a degree of synergy. Uh, luckily, there are several clinically relevant PARP inhibitors, including niraparib, uh, olaparib, and velaparib, and several uh, NAMPT inhibitors, uh, including deporinad, uh, a molecule referred to as GMX1778, and a newly emerged uh, NAMPT inhibitor from Genentech called GNE-617. Um, gratifyingly, when all of these drugs were combined with one another, they all displayed a very similar synergistic outcome uh, as the original uh, combination of niraparib and deporinad. So, moving forward, uh, and this is an example of uh, something that I recommend for all uh, studies that explore drug synergies or antagonisms, um, before one invests too much into uh, advanced studies in an in vivo setting or even uh, translational studies into humans, uh, it's recommended that uh, the mechanism by which the synergy is affected is explored. Um, the best way to do that is to consider the mechanism of each drug uh, 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 on its own. Um, NAMPT uh, is the uh, rate determining step of the two-step process which governs the salvage pathway for NAD biosynthesis. Um, that salvage pathway shown here. Um, NAD being a uh, ubiquitous biomolecule all cells uh, require uh, and governs, governs multiple enzymatic processes, governs much of the metabolic state of a cell. Um, PARP uh, is part of the DNA repair pathway. Um, when DNA is damaged, PARP is recruited to that site of damage uh, where it creates something called the PAR complex. Uh, to create that PAR complex, uh, uh, PARP relies upon two metabolites, two biochemicals, NAD and ATP. Once the PAR complex is created, um, uh, other DNA repair elements are recruited to that site uh, where um, the lesion is repaired and DNA fidelity is restored. Based upon these two mechanisms, we surmised that uh, uh, um, PARP's ability to kill uh, or, or significantly um, cause issues for a cancer cell, uh, PARP inhibition, when, uh, when, when PARP is inhibited uh, to kill cells, is reliant upon the presence of NAD as a biochemical. If we are reducing the available pool of NAD by inhibiting the salvage pathway uh, with a NAMPT inhibitor, um, we would exacerbate uh, the effect uh, of the PARP inhibitor. Um, and of course, this is uh, an easy thing to test. All we have to do is exogenously put NAD back into the system. Um, when we do that, we see that we've abrogated the single agent effect of the NAMPT inhibitor entirely um, and uh, removed all of the synergistic uh, nature of uh, the combination of the NAMPT inhibitor with the PARP inhibitor. Um, Mechanistic uh, uh, studies uh, going beyond uh, uh, that type of uh, uh, an evaluation can include things like uh, uh, genomics evaluations of, of these cells when they're treated with one uh, of the drugs um, or the combination of those drugs. Um, uh, so transcriptomics, RNA-seq data, metabolomics, uh, proteomics can be captured to give a better sense of of how the cell is responding to each of those drugs individually um, or the combination of those drugs. Um, I won't go into all of that data with one exception. Uh, one of the, the places where we saw a synergistic outcome was from the proteomics uh, examination 
of these drug combinations. Um, two key parts of the cell stress pathways, the P38 MAP kinase and the SAP junk kinase, were noted to be synergistically induced, uh, the phosphorylated versions of those enzymes, um, synergistically induced when uh, the NAMT and PARP inhibitors uh, were combined. Um, and that gave us a, a better insight into how these, these drugs are acting in a synergistic fashion. Um, following mechanistic explorations into these drug combinations, it's imperative uh, before considering a translation of that discovery into human uh, clinical trials um, that these outcomes are shown to be uh, effective in established animal models of the disease. Um, two good uh, xenograft models of UN sarcoma exist, and when we applied niraparib and the gen Genentech inhibitor, which is um, uh, 618, GNE 618 in this particular example, uh, uh, the combination of these drugs uh, did have uh, a synergistic uh, effect on the outcome, or at least a, a, a beyond additive effect on the outcome uh, in both terms of tumor volume reduction and uh, survival of the, the, the mice. So that's a good example of, uh, of some of the, of how we pursue these types of projects. Um, these kinds of studies are great. Uh, uh, there's, there's two different, I, I always view these kind of studies as two different uh, uh, real key ways that we pursue uh, drug combination studies in our lab. One is from a, a systems biology perspective. This is a great systems um, uh, uh, biology experiment. Uh, the, the ability to see synergy when you, when you inhibit two enzymes which might have been uh, previously thought to be unrelated or pathways that, that were previously not known to intersect. Um, and then, of course, the translational benefit to these studies, the actual uh, vetting of drugs which could be considered for the treatment of the human disease. Um, from the system's perspective, uh, the concept of synthet synthetic lethality uh, is, is, a, is, is more of a genomic-based uh, uh, term, at least historically has been, um, where we consider that uh, a normal cell, uh, when you uh, uh, knock out a specific gene uh, using um, RNAi or CRISPR-based technologies, doesn't have any effect on a healthy normal cell, um, nor when you knock out a, a second gene. Uh, again, no, no real effect. But in a cancer cell where a specific gene, in this, in this illustration, gene B, has been mutated in some way, shape, or form, uh, the subsequent knockout of gene A uh, becomes uh, uh, what's referred to as synthetic lethal for that, those transformed cells. Um, the concept of synthetic lethality in terms of drug combinations uh, is a little bit more uh, muddy in terms of, of how we examine or, or consider or label two drug combinations to be synthetically lethal um, when combined. Going back to the aforementioned niraparib and dipornad example, the studies that we typically pursue um, select for, enrich for, drugs which are already active on their own. Uh, Deporinat here you can see is active at a, a low nanomolar concentration, so 24% uh, 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 response uh, when the drug was dosed in this particular assay at 6.2 nanomolar. That's a very strong response by itself uh, before it's ever, ever combined with the Nampton or the PARP inhibitor. Um, uh, likewise, the PARP inhibitor, uh, its activity right around the 4 or 5 micromolar um, uh, IC50 value type of uh, representation of its activity. Um, again, for, for PARP inhibitors, that's pretty active for an in vitro uh, cytotoxicity-based assay. Um, so these drugs are already active, very active on their own. Where we see synergy typically is at the interface of the active-inactive range. And that synergy is actually uh, fairly localized to a subset of concentrations. Um, uh, which is why we refer to synergy at, at a specific concentration overlap of two drugs. When we consider the concept of synthetic lethality, we're looking for broad synergy, uh, broad cell death that occurs when drug A and drug B are essentially inactive on their own. Um, more recently, we've begun to survey drugs which are less active or wholly inactive by themselves. Um, here's an example of a matrix plot uh, generated uh, between a drug A and a drug B in a specific assay, where drug B really had almost no activity at the concentrations that we surveyed. Um, drug A's activity uh, really plateaus right around the 50% mark. 
Um, however, when you see the com combination, uh, there's broad synergy uh, across many concentrations for both drug A and drug B. Um, I, I, think, I think if I were to call this, this combination synthetically lethal, I think there'd be plenty of reason to push back on that. Um, but this gets closer to a synthetic lethal event when combining two drugs which are either fully inactive or largely inactive at, the concent at a broad swath of concentrations. Um, additional considerations from the system's perspective. Um, drug polypharmacology uh, may very well complicate the analysis of two different drugs when combined. Um, consider uh, uh, some data that we've generated uh, for the combination of this molecule called uh, dinocyclib. Um, this is a molecule that's uh, reached phase three evaluation uh, in a handful of, uh, of oncology indications. Its mechanism is reported to be uh, an inhibition of the cyclin-dependent kinase isoforms 2, 7, and 9. Uh, these are isoforms of the cyclin-dependent kinase, which are essential for the uh, DNA transcription process by uh, RNA Paul 2 um, We were excited to see uh, uh, combinations of dinocyclib uh, uh, with multiple drugs, including what I'm referring to as drug A. Uh, strong synergy uh, for this particular um, combination at specific concentrations. And you might consider that this is potentiation of the activity of dinocyclib uh, uh, by drug A, since drug A has, has little to no activity on its own. Now, this was an uh, easy thing to elaborate upon. There are many inhibitors of the cyclin-dependent kinases, including specific inhibitors of the 2, 7, and 9 isoforms. Um, including this molecule, um, SNS032, <coughs> um, which ha has been in phase one uh, clinical evaluations in humans. Um, however, the combination of drug A uh, with SNS032 did not result in uh, a similar level of potentiation or synergy uh, uh, as we'd seen with uh, dinocyclib. We were interested to note uh, a year, maybe two ago, um, the report um, that this drug, uh, dinocyclib, is also a effective inhibitor of several epigenetic factors, including uh, bromodomain isoforms two and four. Um, the BET bromodomains have become emerging drug targets um, in recent years, and uh, uh, there are good established inhibitors of BRD2 and BRD4 including this rather remarkable molecule called JQ1. Now, when we went back into this specific assay and asked, does drug A uh, synergize with uh, bromodomain inhibitors, uh, we did see a broader element of synergy, uh, uh, akin to what we saw for dinocyclib. This led us to uh, theorize that the uh, mechanistic rationale for the combination of drug A uh, with dinocyclib was more based upon its ability to target uh, BET bromo domains than its activity as a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor. So, uh, additional considerations, this time from the translational perspective. Um, if you're interested in considering uh, drugs that from an in vitro screen showed synergy, uh, if you're interested in translating those to a potential human clinical evaluation, it's paramount that you consider uh, the drug pharmacokinetics. Um, here are, uh, these are generic uh, uh, um, illustrations of drug uh, exposure concentrations over time uh, from a human clinical evaluation of those drugs. So for, foremost, you have to ask yourself, are the drugs acting uh, uh, at concentrations which are achievable in the human host? So the more potent, the better is a general rule. Um, so you can see it marked as X, uh, uh, this is the theoretical uh, minimal concentration that is needed uh, for drug uh, A, and then on the right plot, uh, uh, another theoretical concentration minimum that needs to be achieved by drug B. If you've achieved exposures over what you believe uh, those drugs are required to work at, then it's important to consider the pharmacokinetics of drug A and drug B to make sure that there's a window of overlap. If you assume that the synergistic uh, output of those drugs um, is reliant upon them being 
present at the same time. Um, and of course, what I've done in this particular generic, generic um, uh, example is shown a, a window of activity uh, for drug A, which occurs between hours one and nine uh, after dosing, and a window of activity for drug B, which occurs uh, between hours 10 and 15 after dosing. Um, based upon those uh, pharmacokinetic outcomes, uh, it might not be advisable to combine drug A and drug B uh, in a human uh, uh, condition, in a human host, because their uh, activity uh, uh, overlaps would not occur. Um, that's not to say that drug uh, combinations uh, uh, have to uh, be present at the same time. Um, a paper that was reported in uh, the journal Cell in 2012 does a very good job at showing that sequential applications of drugs may yield better outcomes. Uh, this is work out of the Yaffe lab at MIT, uh, a really remarkable uh, uh, lab. Um, this, these, are, these are plots out of the paper that uh, show uh, how uh, an exploration of the sequential application of drugs um, resulted in the combination of doxorubicin and erlotinib. Um, where uh, uh, pre-application of the drug erlotinib um, followed by uh, application of doxorubicin resulted in uh, a much stronger um, increase in the percent of apoptotic cells than the combination of that, those drugs uh, um, uh, concomitantly. Um, this was later shown in the paper to uh, be true in in vivo experiments as well. Um, additional considerations uh, from the translational perspective. Um, uh, if you're considering moving uh, uh, specific uh, drug combinations into a human host, it's, it's essential that you consider um, uh, the clinically defined toxicities for both drugs. Uh, these are just, uh, just uh, made up examples where drug A and drug B have an overlapping um, uh, toxicity liability um, in terms of thrombocytopenia. Um, uh, it would be uh, not advisable to combine two drugs with a similar um, uh, uh, well-defined clinical toxicity. Um, uh, the clinical uh, toxicities, uh, it's important to go beyond um, those, those more uh, uh, blunt assessments of a drug's uh, uh, toxic toxicities. Um, digging in into uh, key um, preclinical toxicity uh, 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 data is also important. Um, as if, for instance, uh, the transporter BSEP um, has emerged as a, uh, a, a preclinically validated uh, uh, um, uh, transporter to evaluate to make sure that your drug or the drugs don't have uh, activities as a BSEP inhibitor. Um, of course, a single drug by itself inhibiting BSEP at a, at a low uh, percentage, 15 or 20 percent, uh, might not be cause for that molecule not entering into human clinical trials. But if two drugs uh, with low BSEP activity are combined, the combined actions of those drugs might take it over uh, what would be a reasonable amount of BSEP inhibition that would not uh, uh, be advisable. So evaluation of preclinical toxicology packages uh, is also something that needs to be done before um, two drugs are considered for human clinical uh, combination. Um, so finally, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, the fact that with these emerging technologies, the ability to survey tens of thousands of drugs, uh, it's well worth the effort of the scientific community to uh, go back and challenge existing dogma. I'd like to, to highlight a, a, a story from our own uh, work, uh, our own lab's work in combination uh, uh, evaluations of the drug abrutinib. This is work we did in collaboration with uh, the Stout Lab at NCI, uh, and later uh, uh, Wyndham Wilson, who's a, a clinician here at, at NCI. Um, abrutinib is an emerging uh, or an emerged therapeutic uh, for B cell uh, driven lymphomas. Uh, it approved currently uh, already in CLL and, and MCL, I believe, um, uh, with also active uh, clinical activity established for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. 
Um, we surveyed uh, the combination landscape of this molecule in, um, in, vitro, in the in vitro setting um, in diffuse large B cell lymphoma cell line models. Um, we saw strong synergies uh, between imbrutinib and uh, key signaling pathway nodes uh, that were part of uh, the already defined um, signaling elements that drive the proliferative uh, nature of diffuse B cell lymphomas, um, as defined by the Stout Lab and others. Uh, for instance, we saw remarkable synergy between imbrutinib and inhibitors of the PI3 kinase uh, 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 class of enzymes. Uh, good, strong synergies between inhibitors of uh, anything really that, that stimulated the NF kappa B pathway. Um, strong synergy between uh, BCL2 uh, inhibitors and ibrutinib. Um, these were, uh, I would say, uh, not totally uh, surprising to uh, the Stout Lab or others who have studied um, this particular uh, signaling pathways that govern this cancer. Um, we also noticed uh, a number of synerg synergies and antagonisms between ibrutinib and more classical chemotherapeutics. Um, the bar charts represent strong, on the left, strong synergy in green between ibrutinib and classical chemotherapeutics like doxorubicin, etoposide, cytarabine. Uh, we also noticed a significant number of ibrutinib antagonisms, uh, antagonisms with uh, classical chemotherapeutics, most predominantly the antifolate class, so drugs like uh, methotrexate. Um, Building upon this knowledge, uh, the Stout and Wilson labs uh, designed a new clinical regimen for the treatment of primary central nervous system lymphomas that included a pretreatment with ibrutinib followed by the combination of uh, established chemotherapies like temozolomide, uh, toposide, and dexamethasone. Um, uh, the name of this was uh, 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 Teddy R, uh, this, this particular uh, combination regimen. Um, notably missing from this was methotrexate. Uh, based upon the work that we had found and that the Stout Lab had um, confirmed uh, that methotrexate combines in an antagonistic fashion with ibrutinib, uh, we decided, uh, or the Wilson uh, team, uh, Wilson clinical team, decided to remove this from this particular combination, uh, uh, clinical combination. Um, the results were uh, staggering, really. 80-some um, uh, um, percent uh, complete uh, remission, um, with uh, a number of uh, remissions going on today uh, of the uh, 18 patients which were uh, evaluatable from this study, which is reported in the journal Cancer Cell uh, in 2017. Um, so I hope that this, uh, this lecture uh, provided some background uh, historical on how drug combinations have been discovered over the years, um, some of the modern methods and some of the ways that we can define synergy versus uh, additivity versus antagonism. Um, uh, what remains for me to do is to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, the, the individuals who have been part of uh, NCATS and the NCI team, which has really spearheaded this work over the years. Um, special uh, uh, mention for Leslie Matthews, who did all the original work uh, 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 on our platform, Raj Guha, who I already mentioned, uh, built the data processing and, and web interface for the evaluation of the data that we generate. Paul Shin, uh, who uh, worked out the compound management details. Uh, Zhao Hu Zhang, uh, who does a significant amount of the current work uh, on, that our team pursues in this domain. Uh, Mindy Davis, who did the uh, study in Ewing sarcoma that I highlighted. Uh, Crystal McKnight, uh, who does the day-to-day -day compound management operations. Sam Michael, Mark Farrar, who really uh, was a key element of, uh, of really establishing this platform uh, uh, at NCATS. Uh, many others uh, uh, who are, are listed here and some, many others who are not. Uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, key collaborators like Lou Stout and Wendell Wilson, uh, Tom Waldman, uh, Christine Heskey and Lee Hellman, who I'd mentioned were part of the Ewing's uh, uh, study, uh, Javed Khan, who's done a number of the studies with us, uh, who's at NCI, and many others. Um, and finally, it's very important for me to acknowledge the incredible scientists and clinicians who, over the past several decades, have defined uh, the science of, of drug combinations. Thank you for watching this lecture. I hope it was of use. Um, if you do have questions, uh, please contact the course coordinator, uh, and uh, 
we can probably resolve them. Thank you.